What is the best depiction of the Joker? We already covered the bat, so it makes sense to cover his best friend. To me, the answer is simple. It is Mark Hamill's Joker from the Arkham video game series. Surprise! <laughs> and in this video, I'm going to show you why. In case you couldn't already tell, I already covered the Batman in this video, and just like in that case, there is a disclaimer. disclaimer. The Joker has been kicking ass and taking names since 1940 when he appeared in Batman number one. So again, no, this will not be an entire look at the publishing history of the Joker, but we do have to establish some important principles in order to do our analysis. It's simple. Second time, same as the first, the most important question that we have to ask ourselves is what exactly makes a good Joker. The best part about this character and the most intriguing thing when it comes to a storytelling perspective, whether it be Jack Napier or a random psychotic anarchist that decided to be him one day, he does not have one true origin story. I know. I got these scars. And that's exactly what makes him so compelling as a character. Anybody could have one bad day and end up becoming the Joker. Just like that, boom. In contrast to Batman, for example, where there's two contrasting personalities that are vying for the body of Bruce Wayne, the Joker is just the Joker. The society that he lives in has molded him into an agent of chaos. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to be the Joker in a sea of supervillains? Bane, Poison Ivy, Mr. Freeze, all of them have powers that could literally turn this man into a toothpick, but everybody follows his orders. Because his MO has always been to break down his opponents and lead the other villains with psychological warfare. We may be scared of you, but we're terrified of him. After 10, 20, 30 years fighting Batman in every single different type of media, yes, at one point he does figure out that Bruce Wayne is Batman and he uses that to his advantage. Specifically going after his loved ones, the Bat family, or even using his psychological trauma against him. And I thought my jokes were bad. The coolest stories involving the Joker often emphasize this obsession that he has with Batman. Just like he is consumed to be an agent of chaos, Batman is the opposite and he's obsessed with delivering justice. So regardless of how you frame him, whether it be a campy, funny, slapstick version or a dark, sadistic anarchist, I kind of like this one, Bob. The Joker must always revel in his opponent's psychological turmoil. Now that we know what makes a good Joker, how do we choose between the ones that we've seen so far? The first live action appearance that we remember is from 1966 with Adam West, Adam West. A little bit softer now. Adam West. Taking the role of the Cape Crusader. Precisely. And Cesar Romero playing the Joker. This was a campy fest embracing the golden age of comics, slapstick comedy, cool gadgets, and wacky situations that would test the Batman and put the Joker at the forefront. Moving on as the years have gone by, playing the Joker is also deemed to be an honor just like it is to play Superman or Batman. After we got Cesar Romero, we had the iconic introduction of Jack Nicholson in Tim Burton's Batman movie. Although Jack Napier did meet his grisly demise at the end of that one, his performance was instrumental in establishing a baseline for what we should get from a Joker character. What we got from Jack Nicholson was a crazy sadistic performance from a true villain that was also rooted in funny comedy and relishing in being the villain. He sees people as fodder. Done. And the only motivation that he truly has is to torment Batman. Don't think that I didn't try. Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson were perfectly cast for this project. They represent both sides of the spectrum, even though Bruce Wayne is noticeably marked by the mistakes of his past and his past trauma, he is still willing to go the extra mile to stop the Joker. You wouldn't hit a guy with glasses on, would you? Huh? The dark brooding Batman against the psychotic Joker, that is the recipe for success. By this point, you know that we covered the 90s because they were absolutely crazy, but we didn't get to see the Joker in any of the Joel Schumacher projects because at this point in the original trilogy of the Tim Burton verse, the Joker was already gone. So if we do some quick maths, we only had two real depictions of the Joker in over 30 years of cinematic storytelling. Cesar Romero being the campy clownish villain, and then you get Jack Nicholson's Joker in the Tim Burton franchise. So what are the iconic and emblematic performances of the Joker? Of course, this means Heath Ledger, Joaquin Phoenix, and 
Zach Galifianakis. The guy from The Hangover, yeah, he also voiced the Joker in the Lego Batman movie. I got a pretty dope sense of humor, bro. And he did an outstanding job playing with the moral compass and the psychological state of the Joker. So let's start with him. In this story, without giving too much away, the Joker realizes that Batman doesn't care about him, and that has been his sole purpose for existing. And he could take care of all the villains at the same time because they're all afraid of him. But in this project, Batman tells him, You mean nothing to me. And that is what sets the Joker's mind ablaze. What happens when the person that you've been obsessed over for the past 10, 20, 30 years doesn't really want to keep giving you the time of day? He spirals into himself and realizes that the only way to get back into Batman's graces is to completely ignore him. You tell him, Joker, it's time for a fresh start. He's, He's not, not worth it. it. Mixing in the crazy slapstick comedy with the more psychologically disturbed undertones of this Joker was a great choice from Chris McKay. So, the Lego Joker was good, so what about the live-action Jokers that we mentioned already? By this point, you know that Joaquin Phoenix played the Joker in an alternate timeline version of the character. Definitely a sadder version of the character, who is a product of a society that does not care for people like him. People with mental health issues, people with physical health issues that need financial and emotional support from people around them, and of course, getting shunned by society for being part of the untouchables, essentially. That can concoction of toxicity around the environment that you grow up in is the catalyst for Joaquin Phoenix's Joker to become the enigmatic villain that we know. It is a sad story that leads to a life of chaos, and we're going to be getting a sequel, Folie à deux, which will introduce the final part of the puzzle, which is Harley Quinn. Because in the end, regardless of what you think, the Joker is the catalyst for Harley Quinn's descent into madness. So we have the funny one with psychological warfare in Zach Galifianakis, and the one that is a completely disturbed individual that is basically forced upon this role with Joaquin Phoenix. But everybody knows, outside of the comics, the most important version of the Joker, at least in movies, is definitely Heath Ledger. You just couldn't let me go. His performance in The Dark Knight is a full character study into what the Joker is. He is not Jack Napier, he doesn't have an origin story, he is just one person that went a little bit too cuckoo in the head and became the true embodiment of chaos. He does not care about money, Money, power, fame, all he cares about is putting people in positions where they have to test their moral compass. It's about sending a message. And that is the iconic moment where we see the meetings of the unstoppable force against the immovable object. Every once in a while, I decide to go back and revisit the interrogation scene because Christopher Nolan truly understands the duality between these two characters. They need each other in order to survive. And the Joker says it himself. You complete. Me. Which is a great allegory for the yin yang. With an equal amount of justice and goodness that can come from Batman, there has to be an equal amount of deranged psychopathic craziness from the Joker to combat it. I always look at Heath Ledger as being one of the most iconic performers of his age because he was able to put a mirror on ourselves. If we do end up letting our deeply rooted and psychologically repressed urges come out, Hi. it could lead to us becoming an agent of chaos for the people around us and destroying the lives of the people that we love. Everything burns. So before we continue, I do have to say, Heath, this one is for you. May you forever rest in peace. Moving on from that, there's some things that we can already conclude. The live action and animated depictions of the Joker with Zach Galifianakis have covered different areas of the Joker. Wait, is that sarcasm? And the different meanings that he has as a character in this psychotic and chaotic society that he lives in. But if you noticed it by now, you know that there's something missing. If there's so many good depictions of the Joker, which one is the best? And this is where we get the introduction of the most iconic performer to ever put on the boots of the Joker, Mark Hamill. Yeah, did you know that Luke Skywalker also plays your favorite villains? From Fire Lord Ozai to the Joker, Mark Hamill can do it all, and in the in the case of the Joker, he is the definitive version of the character. Lined up side to side with Kevin Conroy, this man has 20 years of experience playing the Joker. I'm completely sold. His version of the Joker is cunning, disturbed, driven, and most importantly, psychotic at every step along the way. Every live action Joker and even Zach Galifianakis' version have explored different facets of the Joker. Yeah! Everybody get a bomb, let's go. Bomb, 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 let's bomb it out. Yay! 
but Mark Hamill's covers all of them. He is the arsonist, the psychopath, and the anarchist all at the same time. Even from beyond the grave, his version of the Joker is still able to torment Batman, and it is a beautiful sight to see. If you need any further proof, you can look directly at Batman the Animated Series and, of course, the movies and TV shows that involve him as the Joker. Specifically, I urge you to look upon Batman the Mask of the Phantasm and, of course, the Batman Beyond movie. The voice, the laugh, the psychopathic tendencies to basically mock everything around him even at the point of his own detriment. And Mark Hamill is able to embody even those moments where the Joker questions if this is all worth it, especially when he's interacting with Tara Strong's Harley Quinn. He does feel, in a deeply deranged way, some sort of love and affection for Harley. But his love and twisted affection for the Batman will always be stronger. Sorry, but there is no prize for second place. That is what we see in the Arkham video game series. He takes the 20 years of experience that he has playing this character to put all of that thematic and behavioral undertones into this performance. From Arkham Asylum to Arkham City and eventually Arkham Knight, you get to see the full progression of the Joker's life as a mirror image of Batman. Again, where there is extreme good, there must also be extreme evil to combat it. It's really crazy to me what they did in Arkham City because they show you how the Joker is truthfully willing to let himself be the final victim and ultimately lose his life in an attempt to prove a point. It is a running Again, if you haven't played the series, which I highly recommend, yeah, by this point, spoiler alert. Kevin Conroy's Batman truly tells him, you know what, across all of the different years that you have tormented me and the people in Gotham, the people that you have killed, the people whose lives you've destroyed, and everything else under the sun, in the end, I would have saved you. And that is where we get this iconic phrase from the Joker himself. <laughs> that actually is... Funny. Moving even further from that, the only Joker that truly stepped out of this format was Zach Galifianakis' version, which realizes that being the Joker is the only reason that Batman cares about him. Is that sarcastic? But in the end, when he's done playing the part of this agent of chaos, who is going to remember him? What about that? And that is what we see in the third game. A Joker who is hell-bent on using his influence over the Batman to torment him and lead him into a path of despair. And so, in a beautifully poetic moment, we get to see the Joker finally be jailed by his own mind. No! Bruce! Don't leave me! Please! Yeah, that was a lot of information. So, why should we decide to crown Mark Hamill's as Joker as the definitive version of the character? From the iconic vocal performance, to the track record that he has playing the character, and of course, the situations that he puts Batman in, whether it be through TV shows, movies, or video games, this is the true definition of what the Joker is supposed to be. He is just as much the main character as Batman. Best of all, regardless of however hard the Batman can go to try to stop him, he is all always willing to match that level of intensity and embrace the brutality that comes with it. If you haven't played the games, seen the TV show, or watched the movies, I highly recommend that you do, because you will be truthfully able to appreciate why Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill are the definitive versions of the Batman and the Joker alike. Mark Hamill has been an inspiration for my entire life, so this one is also for you. Between Heath and Mark, we will always have iconic depictions of what the true definition of chaos looks like. Are you happy now? But now you made it to the end of the video, so let me know in the comments which characters do you think I should cover next. And while you're down there, make sure to drop a like and share this with your friends because, well, it's free. And as always, I'll see you on the next one.